Cowboys Nation, welcome into another special one-on-one -on -one interview. I'm Danny Sarek and I bring with you one of the best, funniest guys in this industry, ESPN's Mike Golick Jr. Mike, thank you for joining me today, coming on to talk some Cowboys football. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Danny. Looking forward to this. Absolutely. I can't even ask you how you've been staying busy the last couple months because the answer is you've been prepping for your own show. Congratulations. That started earlier this week. Why don't you give everyone just a quick little rundown on, on what your new show is? Yeah, uh, so it's called Chenea and Golick Jr. It's 4 to 7 Eastern, Monday through Friday on ESPN Radio, ESPN News. You can get the podcast wherever you get those as well. But it's myself and Chenea Gwumike, who's super unique. She is a current WNBA player. She plays for the LA Sparks because of injury this year. She's not inside the WNBA bubble. She's got some past injuries, didn't want to put herself at risk there. And so because of that, her and I get to start this show together. So it's incredibly exciting. You know, I played my college football at Notre Dame. She was a college star at Stanford, a number one overall pick. And we get to hang out in the afternoons down on weekdays. So hopefully everyone will check that out. We're, we're getting through our first week and feeling pretty good about it so far. Congratulations. It's so exciting. And this is part of the new schedule for ESPN, which ended up including the end of your dad's illustrious, you know, two decade career on ESPN radio. And I'm just curious because you were on a couple of shows with him and you got to have that professional experience with him. How much did what you learned from him prep you for your own show now? Oh, it's huge, you know, getting to, getting to work alongside dad and certainly learn from him in that regard, just the day-to-day -day stuff. But like you said, watching him for two plus decades, be the one at the helm of one of the biggest radio shows, you know, for 18 years of Mike and Mike in the morning when they were what they were for so many people in the sports talk landscape, watching him navigate leading a show like that, being in charge of all the things that are outside just the normal hours of radio that you have to do to properly go about that. And so getting to talk to him about it now, you know, I, I you know, live 20 minutes from him. So I see him plenty now. I've been talking to him all week, kind of getting tips on everything. So it's a great resource to have. He is obviously, you know, a, a two-time radio hall of famer, one of the best to ever do it. So very fortunate to, to have dad along here to, to help me along the way as I figure out how the hell I'm doing this. I have to say, I was very impressed on his last show when your whole family was there. It made me emotional, and I don't even know your family. I have no idea how you guys were able to get through that last show and, and, and talking to him about the way that you've seen his career grow on that last show. Yeah, and, and I think that was what the show with him has always been about. From the, the minute he started doing radio at ESPN, I was in the third grade, and we were all told this is going to be a family show. And so if you do something, it's going to get talked about. We want to involve our families in it. And so it felt like the right way to, to close his career for ESPN radio, doing it with our whole family together the way it had always been. And to your point, so many people reached out because those are things, even without knowing us, everyone's got a relationship with their family. Everyone wants to feel like, and that was always the most relatable part, I think, of the show was at the end of the day, it was just us presented as we were in front of the audience. And a lot of people, the notes that we got were really kind. And uh, just to get to share that together was something I think we'll always remember. Yeah, really special. Well, congratulations on your new show. I do want to dive into some Cowboys football now, um, which it excites me because before this started, you know, we were kind of talking about how you are more of a fan of former teammates. And so you have some on this team and we'll talk about those later. But you were saying that you are more of a Cowboys fan now, which I love to hear. Um, and I want to start first with the defensive line. Because all offseason, a lot of the hype was on the offense of this team. You know, they were the number one offense last year. They had a lot of carryover with the addition of C.D. Lamb. So, of course, that's going to get excitement. But as of late, it's been the defensive line because the return of Tyrone Crawford, you have Demarcus Lawrence, and now you have the acquisitions of Don Terry Poe, Alan Smith, Everson Griffin. This is a very scary defensive line under new defensive coordinator Mike Nolan. Yeah, and I think that's probably one of the headlines that's gone under talked about this offseason is Mike Nolan taking over that defense, his experience and football outsiders talks a lot about this blitzing linebackers as a part of that crew in New Orleans and the success they were able to have with guys like Demario Davis. And so now you come over here, that D line's going to get help from its linebacker core in that way. But you're right. You lose Robert Quinn. Obviously, that's a tough blow here. But all the names you mentioned and then Everson Griffin might be one of in an offseason 
full of great acquisitions and certainly great drafting by the Cowboys. One that when you bookend with Demarcus Lawrence will give them a boost in a big way because that offense made such a leap last year it's only natural that it's probably going to regress a little bit and the defense I think with Mike Nolan and company there is ready to pick up the slack in a big way with all that talent they've got at every level and we've already heard that it's going to be a little different this year with new schemes and really focusing on taking the ball away so that's exciting too because those takeaways all on the defense was a major issue for this Cowboys defense last year the, the sad part about this defensive line is the loss of defensive tackle Gerald McCoy, who they sound and signed in the offseason. The first padded practice, I mean, tore the right quad tendon in his leg. And that's just, you know, it was a freak accident. And it's something, unfortunately, that that's going to happen. And, you know, he was part of those really high expectations on this defensive line. What are the Cowboys going to miss now from that void? Well, you know what? I actually think, and this is a real credit to Gerald McCoy, because football-wise and production-wise, Gerald McCoy is probably not what he once was at the prime of his Tampa Bay career, but he's an incredibly consistent veteran leader. And what we've seen from him since that injury took place, and he put out videos and he's put out statements saying he's still going to be a resource to the guys on this team. And he said that's been consistent where everywhere that he's been. Having that day-to-day -day leadership gone from that spot and that's not a knock on Demarcus Lawrence or anyone else but as things go through all the uncertainty that we did this offseason a voice like that can mean a lot for a group that's trying to gel and so it sounds like he's gracious enough to still try and be that influence but I think not having him around there day to day for this group is going to be a loss because he seems like that gregarious of a personality that guy that's as infectious and has a positive influence on his peers as he has basically everywhere he's been. You're right. He's, he seems to be still he's going to reach out to the guys and offer any support or advice he can. I mean, thankfully, there is some depth. Tyron Crawford can play inside. Tristan Hill has been uh, getting really high praises in his second year now. Rookie Neville Gallimore. So there is some depth inside for the defensive line. Um, but the Cowboys waived him. And while they were saying, you know, they're they're emphatic and, and they believe he'll end up being a Cowboy in the future when he recovers from this industry or from this injury, but I think this shows the business side of this industry. And this isn't the first time that Cowboys fans have seen this this offseason because quarterback Dak Prescott did not get that long term deal. And arguably, he should have gotten that deal last offseason. So he ended up signing the franchise tag. And, you know, I think that just reminds people that this is a business and just the way that the teams see these players as a business, they have to sign contracts they feel comfortable with because it's their livelihoods on the line as well. How much more does Dak need to prove in order to get a deal? I, I don't think any. I, I think what Dak's shown already over the course of his career, I mean, I don't think that wins and losses are necessarily a quarterback stat, but if you want to hug that tight, Dak has been a winner in a Cowboys uniform. He's been a part of a lot of that. This was the second best passing offense by a lot of metrics in the NFL last year and produced in ways that people have been looking for him with Kellen Moore kind of adding some modern elements to that offense, you really saw Dak and the rest of this crew shine. So I think he's shown what he's deserving of. It's not as simple as Patrick Mahomes, where we know unquestionably Patrick Mahomes is the best at the premier position in the NFL. And so, of course, half a billion dollars seems like they might have actually underpaid him somehow in all this. But Dak is in line with those guys, and we've seen this year after year. If you are in the top 10 range of quarterbacks and it's time for your payday, you tend to reset the market. So I was surprised by this decision by the Cowboys. I think financially going forward, they've got a lot of big contracts, a lot of money tied up in quality players and other positions, ones that we've seen them sign this offseason before they got to discussing Dak and a lot of this. And so I think it's going to be difficult going forward, but I think he's got nothing left to prove. And I think this year, you know, you acquire CD Lamb, this offensive line, while you lose Travis Frederick, still has a lot of really quality parts. I would expect them, and I think Cowboys fans would expect them to go out and play really well and only add to Dak's value, which is going to make this difficult. Right. Give him some more leverage. I don't see how there's a, a, a way this pans out to where he doesn't have the leverage at the end of this year. I mean, realistically. Yeah, it, it's absolutely going to put him in a great position and a difficult one for the Cowboys because we know the cap next year is, I think, at least going to flatten, if not go down some. I know the PA uh, and the NFL have already negotiated those things as far as how they're going to spread the losses from this year because of COVID. But then, you know, franchise tagging again next year is going to cost just under $38 million. Dak can sit there understanding he's going to collect fully guaranteed money unless the Cowboys want to move heaven and earth 
to sign him long term or are they going to potentially let him walk? So all of these things become even more interesting because we also know college football and the looks you are going to get at quarterbacks that you might have to think about replacing Dak with are all of a sudden going to be a more difficult proposition to go along with the fact that the Cowboys probably aren't going to be picking high because they're probably going to be pretty good this year. <laughs> Right. The repercussions of COVID from this year are definitely still going to be in play next year. That's a great point, too. Um, this offense, along with Dak, I mean, does have really high expectations from just the sheer talent alone. The receivers is th there's no other trio like Michael Gallup, Amari Cooper and C.D. Lamb in this league. And then you look to the backfield and you've got one of the top running backs in Ezekiel Elliott. You've got a prolific quarterback. I mean, it seems like they have everything they need. Um Mike McCarthy has all of the weapons, all of the pieces he needs to be successful as a new coach in Dallas. Is it possible the expectations for him and this team are too high? I don't think so. And I, I come from this background where I, you know, I played my college ball at Notre Dame and you guys have a couple of uh, domers on the team down there. And that was always the expectation going in. And the Cowboys are that brand in the NFL where Jerry Jones and everybody on down expect this Mike McCarthy's got Super Bowl pedigree in his background and so that's a built-in part of the expectation and I think that was a lion's share of the frustration from last year as everyone saw what you just mentioned this was still an extremely talented roster you know you sub out CeeDee Lamb for Randall Cobb last year and it's still a very productive impactful player that they lost this offseason and so there was talent there last year, and that was the frustration. So, no, Super Bowl ambitions are realistic and, quite frankly, I think more dire for the Cowboys because of the situation with Dak that we talked about. There's uncertainty at the most important position in football after this year. And so maximizing on everything you just mentioned in the here and now in a division that's sort of in flux at this point, you know, with the Eagles, the health of Carson Wentz is a question every year, as it is with the secondary and their wide receiver group in some key spots. We know Washington and New York are both breaking in new quarterbacks and having to go through those growing pains, as well as a new coach in Washington with Ron Rivera. And so the Cowboys look at this as the team with, while well, they're bringing in Mike McCarthy, still, I'd say the most stability overall. When you have the three receivers, the starting receivers that the Cowboys have, they have said that their expectation is for all three of them to have a thousand yard seasons. And if they didn't have Ezekiel Elliott, I think that could really be possible because of the talent. But Mike McCarthy has said, we're not getting rid of the run game. Zeke is also acts as a receiver in some of the plays. So I'm not sure how realistic having 3000 yard receivers is, but how does Mike McCarthy and offensive coordinator Kellen Moore, how can they utilize all of these weapons in the most effective manner when you have so much talent in your running back position as well as your receiving core? Yeah, I think it's a lot of what they did last year. And so many people focus on modern football, the analytics behind play action passing and all the success there are, are noted and understood. But they were great in the drop back passing game last year without the threat of that play fake. And so I think what it allows them to do that continuity from last year, obviously, and I harp on this as a former offensive lineman, the communication without having, you know, uh, um, without having Travis Frederick in the middle there is noteworthy. Joe Looney has been around there. So I, I would expect him to be the guy. You've got a couple of young players like Tyler Biadish, their draft pick that might be in the mix, but making sure that communication is solidified so everyone else can operate like they did last year. I hope, you know, Kellen Moore and, and being a huge part of that offense and continuity helps that because when it comes to CD lamb, rookie receivers tend to have a steep learning curve and a tough time having a major impact right away. And so for him to come in and be able to be brought along slowly to focus on doing things that come naturally to him, that he did well when he was at Oklahoma, bring him along at that pace to where yeah, three 1000 yard receivers doesn't sound crazy, but continuing to have that focus on the downfield passing game for them to only make life easier on Zeke in this offensive line and a running game that for so long had to run their head into the brick wall of eight, nine man boxes at times because they were running into the obvious. Now you keep building in that variable of the downfield passing game. And we'll start to see the most productive looking Zeke Elliott we've seen in a while. And we'll see an offensive line that I know this group is a bit older and a far cry from where they were once is the most dominant line in the league, but those parts are still incredible. And if they're not pounding as much in the run game and they're healthy, that's going to be a very deadly combination as this team continues to push it down the field. The loss of Travis Frederick because he retired is going to be noticeable, I think. And that's not a knock on Joe Looney. Looney filled in in 2018 for Frederick. So he has experience 
at that position with Dak, but you're right. It, it's not going to be the same as when Frederick was down at center, but, but they do still have some of the best alignment, right? you got tackles Tyron Smith and Lyle Collins, two pillars in that Cowboys offensive line. However, Collins and also tackle Cam Irving haven't practiced uh, at training camp. They've been nursing some minor injuries. You know, Tyron Smith has had a, a, a history of some injuries as well. And so it's normal that the Cowboys are having to work in rookies and, and um, less experienced players on that offensive line. However, without OTAs and mini camps and preseason games, the season is quickly approaching. How difficult is it for an offensive line to play as a unit and find that groove when they're having to rotate players in and out this close to the season? Yeah, I, I can, you know, understandably, we've seen this with modern NFL football really since the 2011 CBA that took away so much practice time, offensive or on-field practice time, I should say. Offensive line's a position you just need a ton of reps. Thankfully, these guys have experience with reps in the most meaningful way possible. Game reps are a currency that you can't replicate in the league. And so for those guys to have that to fall back on, I think makes that transition a little bit easier. I worry more about it just from the soft tissue standpoint. If you're not out there getting a lot of those reps coming off the hiatus like they were, do you risk being out of position in a way that compromises that for some guys that do have injury history? But as far as communication, being able to go out there and execute you know, Zach and Lel or have that relationship already. Tyron's used to everything out there. Joe's been around that group for long enough to where communicating things. And in year two of Kellen Moore's version of this offense with the new portions that Mike McCarthy, I'm sure is going to wrinkle in as a guy with an offensive background, having just the relationship they've got in that room and the depth of experience there. You know, I, I saw it firsthand in new Orleans. You had guys like Zach Streep and Jari Evans who, barely needed words to communicate the things that they saw because they had seen it all together through the same set of eyes for so long. So as long as those guys are feeling as close to a hundred percent as possible going into the season, I have a lot fewer concerns just because of the depth of knowledge with this with these guys. And you mentioned a player who has also played an important role, important role continuously on this offensive line, your former teammate, Zach Martin, you guys played together at Notre Dame. What kind of a teammate was he in college? Zach is the best teammate you could ask for. He is simultaneously the best football player I've ever played with or against. Zach's a walk-in Hall of Famer. He's the best guard in the NFL still. And in college, I, I couldn't believe it. We all sat around watching him each and every day, beat everyone in practice, perfect in one-on-ones playing left tackle at Notre Dame and somehow felt like he was getting under talked about through all of this, but that's also his personality. Zach's never going to demand attention or draw attention to himself. He's going to come in there and lead by being the hardest working, most consistent guy in the room and being a guy that you love hanging out in the locker room with. That was some of my favorite parts with our whole group that we had. And that room, the old line room we had at Notre Dame was sitting around after practice, hanging out with these guys, just talking shop. And, and in that way, Zach's the ultimate teammate. You know, I've got to spend some time, you know, at, at Zach's wedding back in the day and see the way him and Tyron and, and uh, Travis all got along. And it seems like he's brought that same sort of presence to the Dallas locker room. He's as consistent as anyone you'll ever meet. And I think when you're looking for certainly the best teammate possible, but also the perfect offensive lineman, that's exactly what any coach player or you know league person is going to look for is that level of top end consistency day in and day out. The praises don't get much higher than that. So it doesn't surprise you in the slightest that what you saw from him at Notre Dame, he has consistently year after year produced that same level of excellence in the NFL. Zach Martin not being a first-team All-American in college is still, to me, to this day, one of the bigger crimes against humanity that exists. And so to watch him come in, I told everybody of that class, and Taylor Luan was in that class of tackles. There were plenty of big names that have gone on well. I said, A, if you wanted to put Zach at tackle in the NFL, he would have been fine. But B, when you put him down there, he's the ultimate technician. He's a guy that does so many things and did so many things as a young player. Zach was a year behind me, and so he came in as a true freshman and was doing things that a lot of guys technique-wise don't right off the bat. So, no, seeing what Zach's done in the NFL for anyone that played with him is exactly what we all expected. And he's the reason you're a Cowboys fan. Cowboys Nation loves to hear that. <laughs> absolutely. I can say if for, if for anybody, it would absolutely be for Zach and for Jalen. Got to show him some love there. We uh, Anyone that's had a gold helmet on, I've gotten a chance to meet Jalen along, along the way too. 
always rooting for those guys. And clearly they've done very well. So there's a lot to make it easy to root for. There have been a lot of changes, not just in Dallas with the coaching staff in the NFC East we briefly touched on, but around the league of new coaches, a lot of quarterback changes, long-term deals. Who is one player or one team you're expecting to just have a breakout year and be the top dog? Yeah, I mean, the obvious one that everyone I think is going to be interested at is what goes on in Tampa Bay here. I think so many people have talked about, well, shortened off season, what you're going to do with all these things. But I actually look at Indianapolis. I think that what they've got there and the off season they had makes a lot of sense for them. You add depth in the interior or quality top end depth of the interior pass rush on their side. You obviously bring in Phillip Rivers behind the best offensive line he'll have ever had in his career bar none and all of that. I thought you drafted well with, uh, with uh, uh, Thomas out of uh, Wisconsin at running back there. And so, or excuse me, Jonathan Taylor out of Wisconsin at running back. It all made sense for them across the board in a division where somehow the Houston Texans just find their way to the playoffs every year because Deshaun Watson is that good. I think they're primed to take a jump and could be a very interesting team when you take a quarterback in Phillip Rivers that a lot of people saw turn the ball over pretty readily last year do all those things that were kind of chipping away at what people thought of him and his ability going forward in much more ideal circumstances with a coach in Frank Reich that he has a lot of familiarity with from their time with the then San Diego Chargers. I can say that without messing it up and having to put money in the swear jar, not calling them the L.A. Chargers now. But I think they're going to be a really interesting team to watch and one that I think has an interesting ceiling in a season where continuity is going to be the mother of all currencies. We talked about it relative to the Cowboys, but it's going to be the usual players, the chiefs, the Baltimore Ravens, the new Orleans saints, these teams that bring back their cores at the quarterback spot at the coaching positions and key offensive skill spots. But Indianapolis is the one team that I think saw through that movement has a chance to actually win their division in a way that I think Tampa Bay is ultimately still going to be staring up at the new Orleans saints at. Okay, so we got the Bucks and the Colts. That's who you've got your eyes on. Okay, good to know. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today, talking general cowboy stuff, uh, you know, NFL stuff. It's It's been a lot of fun, and it means a lot because you spend, you know, what, four or five hours a day talking on your new show. So to come on and talk a little more before that, I'd love to hear it. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Danny, and I'm glad we were able to – be peaceful here, even though I do have some Eagles in my background. So you, we got through what? this. You know your Cowboys stuff. You're saying you're a Cowboys fan. So it evens out. It's totally fine. One more time, Mike, let everyone know how they can listen to your new show. Absolutely. Uh, Chenang Golick Jr. is on ESPN Radio, ESPN News, and Sirius XM Channel 80 from 4 to 7 p.m. Eastern every Monday through Friday. You can also download the podcast and the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts. Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. So we greatly appreciate the listen. It's a fun show. Chanae's a rock star. We're really looking forward to, you know, getting more through the NBA playoffs here. And then obviously on to everyone's favorite, the NFL. That's Mike Gola Jr. I'm Danny Sarek. Thanks for watching Cowboys Nation.